Hello everyone, my name is Arkadiusz Niemiec, uh, I'm running the learning department uh, in Komar. Uh, today I'm going to give you a story. A uh, story how we uh, integrate with some of our products to Ella, how we change our development process, why we did it and how. Uh, at the beginning just a few, a few words about Komar, uh, then just give you a proper background, I will tell you something about service control module, and just a few words about what credit control application is, I will describe our previous solution and, and the problems we had. Uh, then we will move on to the proof of concept we were like. Uh, after that, I will describe our migration process, the benefits, and the summary. Uh, so, basically, Comarex is a public company. Uh, currently, we employ more than 3,500 uh, 3, people uh, worldwide. We delivering solutions for different sectors, telecommunication, trades, services, ERP, and government. Um, my department is focusing on delivering solutions to the telecom market. We have very strong uh, references in uh, uh, <coughs> tier one operators like T-Mobile, Telesonera Group, KPN. Uh, uh, I'm going to now present you what that service control model is. It's a, the module which uh, is located uh, in the GSM infrastructure and, and can play uh, different roles. It could be a typical two uh, way policy and charging function, or just a service control. Uh, the service control can be used in our M2M solution. What is M2M? M2M is uh, when you are putting a SIM card in in simple device like vending machine, a car, a photo. So we have a bunch of SIM cards which uh, are uh, inside some devices, but they are not used by the human, but uh, those SIM cards are used by uh, the devices itself. So the service control module takes care about the, the, the whole bunch of the, the SIM cards. Uh, from the user perspective, uh, the user can configure something which is called a trigger. Uh, the trigger detects a particular situation in the network uh, and then it happens and it's an event and the event can fire one or more action. For example, we can uh, check if a particular SIM card uh, mm, reaches some threshold or uh, we can check that the email is, uh, is wrong. Then we can fire an event and send notification, block uh, SIM cards, we can block uh, mm, a bunch of uh, SIM cards we can also do some fraud detection because, for example, if we detect that the device is moving and we know that it is a vending machine and vending machine usually don't run, we can send a notification to the owner. Uh, so, uh, uh, how it works? Uh, we have two kinds of boxes. Uh, we have uh, something which is called... I hope it's visible. Uh, two kinds of boxes. Uh, the first one is called network adapter and second is called service controller. Uh, network adapter is something which takes uh, the request from the GGSM, usually via the RAMS or via And uh, the, the role of network adapter is just to translate uh, the, the protocol from the network to our internal protocol, <coughs> and also the network adapter is also doing some enrichment of the data. So after that, the network protocol sends the request, to the proper service controller. From the GGSM perspective, network adapter is stateless, so it doesn't matter to which um, component uh, it addresses uh, his request. Uh, but the service controllers are grouped into partitions, and um, uh, network adapter knows to which partition should send the request. Uh, um, at the top, we can see data recovery center because uh, all the time we have to send the events uh, to the data recovery center so in case that first data center collapse the second data center can took over uh, of the whole processing uh, how it looks like from the uh, SIM card perspective so after um, authentication and authorization it opens the dynamic session and uh, it looks like that Syncars is asking, please give me 10 megabytes of units. Please use that 10 megabytes of units. And the server asks, okay, you have 10 megabytes of units for two minutes. And after 
as at such time a GGSN reports that this particular SIM card used uh, like in this example, 8 megabytes and ask for additional 10. And the seller will answer that currently granted same unit is, is 3 megabytes. It works like that. Uh, different vendors, uh, different different vendors um, made some improvements to this protocol. Also, some operators uh, made some improvements, but the main idea is like that. We just ask them for the resources, the resources are reserved, and after uh, some amount of time, we ask for more resources. Okay, uh, so what we did so in our previous solution. So like we uh, you know, like we could see in the previous uh, slide, uh, we had a lot of boxes. So we had to write in a, uh, because our previous solution was written manually in C++. Um, the mechanics for nodes discovery. So we've written something similar to Bonjour protocol, uh, just to. Uh, allow other nodes to automatically discover that something uh, is near the that something is connected uh, to the network because the service controller maintains the state we had to write uh, something similar to in-memory database and we had to fight with CAP theorem about consistency and availability and partitioning we had to also write uh, a mechanism for synchronous application to the uh, replica and a synchronous application to the Data recovery server. We also had to write a mechanism to to make take over in case that uh, any nodes uh, will collapse, and the other should immediately take his responsibility. We also had to deal with online upgrades, but not so easy online upgrades like um, we just install a new version of software because it's too easy. But we had to also deal with the upgrades when the structures structures in the memory database had changed. This is very difficult and tough question. How to do, how to do it uh, when you change the structures inside the memory? And uh, one aspect we had to deal with was the auto healing, because in simple application you had to deal with memory links, um, uh, the memory fragmentation, core faults, etc. We had we had to create a lot of mechanisms to detect that such situation and prevent them. Uh, just to summarize, we created a very sophisticated framework in C++ just to address <coughs> high availability needs. Okay, so what was the problem if we had all, all of these components? We had these components, we can sell them. What was the problem? Uh, the main problem we had uh, with our previous solution was uh, the cost of maintaining this platform. Uh, if you have a C++ app and uh, you want to have it, uh, you, if you want to have it working in current rate, uh, then you have to put enormous um, effort to do it. Let's imagine that a developer makes a very, very little change in the code. Let's say it's log system. He changed it. The other developer, developer made a review. He made a new test. We are on functional test, everything works. Okay? But after two, three, maybe one week of this change, we, we could notice that something happened. Why? Because uh, the other developer didn't uh, notice that the error, the unit test uh, didn't uh, um, uh, uh, find the error, and this little change just corrupted the memory. And corruption, and corruption makes that the system were unstable. So it was very expensive for us uh, to change the system, especially this sophisticated framework. Because of that reason, using those third-party components was also very expensive. Because it doesn't matter that it was open source or closed source, it doesn't matter. Uh, in each library, each library has errors, each. And each library will uh, eventually collapse. Uh, and we had to find in each library, if we had the sources, some dangerous situation. It was quite funny to find that in some libraries we have if error, then exit. If error, then exit. So the moment the error happens, the, the whole system collapsed. <coughs> so, um, as you can imagine, uh, we were 
not very happy of up upgrading our uh, third party components. And uh, one of uh, also important factor which uh, we just struggled a lot was defensive programming. Uh, I don't have exact metrics, but uh, looking at the code, I would say that from, four, from 40 to 60 percent of this framework was uh, handling the errors. So if you look at this code, uh, um, the developer had a problem uh, uh, to look at the functionality. He looked at, he looked at this boilerplate code. And uh, one more factor, which is almost forgotten, that if you develop the calibrate applications, uh, the, developer work, the developers work under huge stress. They are afraid. They are afraid of any change in the system. Because if this change will cause an error, then uh, immediately uh, that the customer will uh, come to us, uh, made us a file. So it, it is a very big problem. Uh, the customer was under huge stress, he has a huge responsibility. Even, is, even, uh, even, though it's made, even though he's making a simple change. Uh, and this caused that uh, developers have a tendency to not to change, not to refactor the code, but instead, instead of this, just to copy the function and change a, a little bit uh, this function and use in the uh, new functionality because it's much safer because the previous function works for years so, so let's, uh, let, let's keep it, let's leave it as it is and uh, what is said that uh, year after year we noticed that C++ language uh, is not um, so um, um, uh, is not chosen by, by the students and and year, year after year, uh, the C++ is, not, is less and less um, understandable by uh, new programmers. But the most glaring problem, the most glaring problem for us that each problem we solved was not inside the domain of the problem, but inside a completely different boilerplate domain. If we wanted to create a functionality, uh, in such kind of system, we wanted to have a very simple flow, but the developer has worked with thread pools, shared pools, locks, mutexes, etc. He didn't uh, so what is the root cause of the problem? Uh, so uh, when we came to the airline. <laughs> Uh, it looks like for us that is our solution for this product, for this product. Uh, and we decided to make a product console. Uh, because I personally don't believe in micro benchmarks, because they don't give me any feeling of the technology. Uh, so we decided to create uh, a driver stack. At such time, we use the third part. Uh, Write the stack uh, written in C++. We are not happy of using it, so so I asked one of the developers, "Hey, maybe you just write a new diameter stack in the technology you have never ever seen before." <laughs> okay, and and after two months, he said, "Okay, I'm ready." And uh, it was incredible that he was um, he created a full diameter stack which was able to work as a crypt control and this data stack was already connected to our online charging system and we took this uh, data stack and tweak uh, with our online charging system and connected the third party CP and it works for a couple of years with an error and, this, uh, and after this proof of concept I was sure uh, that that we have chosen the right path. Unfortunately, uh, we did a, a lot of a good, but completely little job. Because since release 14 BO3, uh, we have the Ericsson stack, um, Ericsson stack in the airline uh, distribution. Okay, so uh, we had to address. Uh, 
couple of things. We have to translate our existing framework uh, to the ARMAC. Uh, availability uh, we have from, uh, from all of the blocks because uh, we can use airline mechanisms, you can use airline takeover mechanisms. Horizontal scalability was also quite uh, simple to, uh, to create an airline um, because of location transparency. Uh, for such an application, you use Minisia database. And it was not so cool because. Uh, session because the Nesia um, has uh, the problem when, uh, uh, when the network split occurs. What is network split, by the way? I know you are familiar with it. When you have two nodes, A and B, and you have uh, the connection between the nodes A and B, and you cut the connection between those nodes, and after some time you, you bring the, the connection back, then you have the network split. And the Nesia did you know what 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 happened? And uh, you you lose immediately the replication measure. Uh, so what we did, we, uh, we had to create ASP application, uh, which uh, which waits for the Mnesia event <coughs> that the Mnesia detects the the split and try to connect the Mnesia again, but not using this Mnesia set master, but some internal function. Which is not exposed, um, unfortunately, uh, and try to do reconciliation as quick as possible. So the session application consistency we had to also struggle with the line, but uh, we, we we finally did it. Uh, zero downtime during upgrades. Uh, in Erlang, you may think that this is very simple, but it's the only simple when you change the code. Um, in our application, uh, we have uh, we have two kinds of data: the configuration data and the live data. The configuration data is something which user can uh, change during the, the configuration process, and the live data is something uh, connected with the balances, SIM cards. Um, uh, during the upgrade, we can tell the user that during this upgrade, you cannot uh, change the configuration. It's it's quite okay. But you cannot uh, uh, tell that you cannot uh, uh, you cannot register new SIM cards. You cannot uh, top up uh, new SIMs. It's impossible. And uh, we didn't find any solution uh, when we change the structures in Indonesia. How to upgrade Indonesia uh, without um, without stopping the app? Because if you have a lot of a lot of nodes, but if, at least you have one replica. The, all the time we have to keep the all nodes up and running. Uh, so we decided to to store all the data in very clunky way. Uh, so key, the version ID, and the value. And uh, and uh, when we change structures, we have to at the beginning upload new beam, a uh, new beam uh, which knows the previous version. And the current version, and this beam is uh, is upgraded on each node. And secondly, we can we can upgrade the full application to to change the data uh, in the new new version. For uh, for the configuration uh, purposes, we created uh, a simple framework. We just uh, and we just have all configuration data in S, and it means that. Uh, we can, uh, before the app, we back up uh, the configuration table, change the table, then we can, uh, we can uh, load new beam, then the new beam can create new ads with new version of configuration, then we can, for, for each app, call uh, a special function which uh, changes the, the ads. Because uh, we couldn't find a solution over the box in LLDP. Uh, when you think about uh, low latency, uh, uh, you cannot forget about the load regulation. And uh, in Erlang, unfortunately, you don't have the load regulation. And there is one function which measures, like, as far as I remember, the frequency of requests, but, but this uh, function wasn't there for us. There is also a framework written by Ufiger, uh, but uh, those times, uh, the framework has a sentence that this framework wasn't used
used in any production yet. Um, so we were afraid about losing this framework. Um, and uh, we were uh, not considered using uh, jobs, also because, as far as I remember, we used sampling technique. You connect some samplers to these jobs, and they they try to check in each node which component was going on. What we did, uh, we did very simple but working uh, uh, solution. We've stolen the idea from automation, uh, uh, so we created just PI controller on the uh, sense controller, and this PI controller, uh, which have this proportional integral and um, neural part, and this uh, PI controller takes care about the uh, number of tokens uh, for uh, for the jobs you can spawn in the service controller. And uh, what we measure, we measure the. Uh, the error as a difference between the requested processing time and the, the current processing time. Okay, and the PI controller decreases the, the number of tokens, and that's why we, we try to um, we, we try to avoid to spawn too many uh, too many processes on the replica. And of course, you have to of course in such system you have to regulate the, um, the speed of the edges. Uh, so on the edges we have the queue, and uh, we uh, use very simple technique that we, we just uh, we know how many requests uh, the system should perform in particular deployment. So we know that if this uh, system has more than a particular number of jobs in the queue, it means that we won't allow to create new jobs. Only ingoing sessions are um, are processed. The benefits of using Erlang is, uh, first of all, robustness of Erlang to machine. We don't have to type anymore about uh, writing something from the scratch. Smaller code. Uh, uh, now that I can see to the code, I can understand the code without uh, the boilerplate uh, and framework around. It's very small and it's uh, very easy to create a test for the code, it's very easy to change the code and, uh, and uh, people uh, now don't have uh, the tendency to defensive programming okay, so we use the, uh, the left crash uh, paradigm what, what help us is Erlang console, so when the developer creates some modules up uh, he can very easily Test it on the console. It was quite impossible using C++ because he had to create a program, compile, etc. Uh, the location transparency was very convenient for us because each app can be distributed uh, uh, distributed in any way without <coughs> changing the code itself. Manisha is, uh, Manisha is for us to, to, to keep the killer app of the airline, but of course you have to uh, you have to at least handle with Unsplit. Oh, and you have to understand how you are going to change the structure during the lifetime of the product. Um, the airline also simplifies uh, our, our, our uh, maintenance of the system because of the tracing possibility and, uh, and um, uh, also code. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we save a lot of money. We save a lot of money using Erlang. It's not I'm not telling the, that I like Erlang because it's, it's cool language. It is cool, but but uh, but after all, we have to deliver the, the proper solution to the customers, and we save a lot of money. And now the developers are uh, more oriented on the problem, how to solve the problem, not what tools that I have to use to achieve some um, some other tools which helps them to solve the problem. Well. Uh, what is also very important for us is that some, sometimes we can even create day after day the change in the, uh, in the code and we are not afraid to, um, to test it because it's, <coughs> the code is so small, it's very easy for us to, uh, to test it, it's very easy to understand, uh, there is no, no threat uh, like before, so even the developers are feeling um, much better of coding in another uh, line than coding in C++. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer uh, to your questions. Did you do some performance comparison between error implementation in C++ and now? 
Yes, but uh, but you, I cannot compare that directly because the previous version has some less functionality. Uh, but I, uh, but what I can say is comparable. It's not that the Erlang version is uh, ten times uh, slower. It's comparable. Approximately how many nodes are running up and running in the system right now? Uh, I cannot give you exact numbers because I'm under NDA uh, with our clients, but uh, but this is uh, from couple to, to it's less than two, it's less than twenty. Okay. Yes. How does it uh, differ from load regulation based on uh, counting requests and rejecting uh, their? Uh, I mean, the, the simple load regulation, just counting requests and cutting off the lines after uh, after going uh, after too much requests in a second, for example. Yeah. You said about load regulation based on tokens. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Okay. So. Uh, mm. Let's imagine that uh, when you want to do any job in the system, you take the token, you do the job, and leave the token. Okay? So the, uh, uh, the load regulation does take care about number of tokens. And uh, uh, we didn't set the exact number of tokens. For example, it's, uh, if you have 4 calls, then we have 16 uh, tokens. Because, uh, because if you have different requests, or if you have local problems on the node, for example, some administration, uh, uh, some admission tasks are now running, then uh, your request will be, uh, will be much, much slower. So the, the purpose of log regulation on the service controller using PID controller is to measure uh, um, is to measure how how fast we can. Uh, do the, the task, and if we uh, do less than we expected, we, uh, we decrease the number of tokens just to allow that the requests which are coming to the system will, uh, will uh, process in such time. And what do you measure? Yeah, the time. Uh, the time. So, based on uh, past requests. Yeah? Sorry? Uh, based on past requests, you, you, you measure the time of, of last request. Yeah? Each request uh, has an influence to PID controller. Okay, so maybe one uh, one commercial. If some of you are interested in working at some beautiful systems, please contact me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.